Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, How to Increase Customer Engagement During Uncertain Times, hosted by Wharton Alumni Funders and Founders Association, or WAFA, and Venture Lab. I'm Irina Yen, the Director of Venture Lab at the University of Pennsylvania, powered by the Wharton School. Uh, and thank you for joining today. We're excited to welcome and connect with alumni and friends from our entrepreneurial community. Um, so how the program will work, uh, today's program will begin with our guest speaker, June Bauer, who will lead with a presentation, and this will be followed by some time for Q&A. Uh, so a couple things to note. Um, first, you may submit a question via the chat window during the presentation, and we will field these questions during the Q&A, which is after June's presentation. Uh, June will also be teeing up a few polls during today's uh, discussion, uh, and you can keep an eye out for the polls link around the lower right-hand corner of your viewer. There's an icon that looks like a graph, and that's the that's the link to the polls so that you may respond when she when she brings those up. Um, so that's our agenda. We'll get started now with um, welcoming our speaker, June Bauer. June started her career in the early days of Apple, where she worked with Steve Jobs and the rest of the at that time 300-person company. Uh, and from there, she assumed VP and Chief Marketing Officer or CMO roles at companies such as Adobe, Alcatel, Cisco, WebEx, and others, and also has worked at Lightspeed Ventures, where she was the marketing partner. So today, uh, June is the talker-in-chief at TalkShop, where she works with startups at all stages uh, and enables those teams to use marketing to effectively grow their businesses. Uh, this afternoon, she'll discuss what specific action you can take to increase customer uh, customer engagement during these uncertain times. Please join me in welcoming June. Well, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to share my screen. So first of all, thank you all so much for taking the time to uh, to join me today, whether it's the middle of the day for you or somewhere towards the afternoon. I'm so happy to have you here. And I also want to thank the whole Wharton team for being an amazing support team and helping put this together and giving me the opportunity to join you today. So I'm hoping that we can make this uh, somewhat engaging. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you the chance to do that, as Irina said, through some polls and also through Q&A. And we'll hold the Q&A till the very end. But you can put your questions in at any time. So you can go ahead and just push that question button. Uh, and uh, and type in a question if you have one at any time, and we'll have plenty of time at the end to cover those. So, you know, a, a few weeks ago, I was on a call and uh, talking to one of my clients, and, and they asked me what I was going to be doing for Thanksgiving. And I have to tell you, like, I, I hadn't even thought about Thanksgiving yet. I, I was completely unaware that it was coming up, which isn't normal for me because I'm usually really excited about this holiday. <laughs> but, you know, I started thinking about it. I thought, yeah, you know, I mean, I love those Thanksgiving dinners, but, well, that's probably not happening because, you know, we're just going to be having Thanksgiving here at home without family and friends this year. And, you know, I'm not sure there's so much to be thankful about this year, to be honest with you. It's been a tough year for everybody. Um, and I'm not feeling so thankful. Yes, I mean, the election probably, you know, now that that's over, I feel better. but. Uh, not just feeling super happy about this year. So I wanted to check in with you and see how you are feeling about this year so far. And so I'm going to ask you to help me right now and take a poll. So let's see. Remember where Irina said that poll button um, looks like a little graph and there should be a blue dot in front of it. If it's not there now, it'll be there soon. Go ahead, press that. And if you wouldn't mind, just tell me how you're feeling. And hopefully we're going to see the results pretty soon. Yes, I can see the results. Awesome. So it looks like most of you are feeling similarly to me, which is more anxiety, frustration, or potentially isolation during this time. A good amount of you. Um, I'm happy for those of you that are happier. <laughs> That's great. I'd love to hear what your secret sauce is there. Um, and those of you who feel the same, hopefully you're feeling pretty good as well. But, you know, I know for a lot of us, things have really changed. Let me bounce back into my presentation here. And I know when the when this whole pandemic first started, I felt like <laughs> the world had, you know, sort of stopped spinning on its axis, the, like this theater. I mean, everything felt shut down. I felt shut down. I felt so isolated. Um, and 
recently, you know, I've been feeling a little bit differently. The other day, I was so sick and tired of being in my office that I just went out at the end of the day and I did a really nice fall walk and I walked through the neighborhood and on my way back, I ran into my neighbors. They they live directly across the street and they had just finished trimming a hedge in front of their house so they could park their car right on the curb. And I started talking to them about what they were doing. Of course, we were yelling across the street and we ended up talking for probably over a half an hour, yelling at each other across the street. But I felt so desperate for engagement and interaction. I, I really, really wanted to talk to them uh, in a way I hadn't before, which was unusual. And um, I realized I was really craving being able to talk to people face to face. And it was fun uh, and really nice. But it really made me think that the way we feel uh, if we're feeling differently, it's probably a way a lot of other people are feeling, and it probably reflects back on our customers as well. It's really, really important to acknowledge how we're feeling and, put, and listen to and understand how our customers feeling as well are feeling as well. And I love this quote from Anne Frank because even if the feelings aren't positive, it's really important that we aren't in denial about them and that we really take the time to understand how we're feeling, but then really listen to our customers and see how they're feeling. Because engagement is really starts with acknowledging and understanding how the person you're engaging with, how they are feeling so that you can best relate to them and be relevant to them. So today, what we're going to do, I want you to walk away today and feel like you have some really good ideas about how to increase engagement. This is going to be very pragmatic. I'm going to give you some specific examples and specific advice. And it's going to cover three main areas, which is how do you listen to your customers uh, in a way that institutionalizes listening? How do you pack a punch? And by that, I mean increase your relevance and be more persuasive. And finally, how do you get people to hear you? How do you get out there and get people to listen to what you're saying? So we'll cover those things. And, you know, as I said earlier, it starts with how you're feeling and then how your audience is feeling. What are they experiencing and what are their concerns? And you need to get to these things. And so the best way to do that is to choose a few ways to listen to them. And if you're in a B2B business, talking to sales is a fantastic way to do that. But I don't mean just go talk to them once and then go back to your job. Institutionalize a way to talk to them. Have a regular sales marketing roundtable once a quarter or even once a month where the whole sole purpose of it is to understand from the sales team what they're hearing from prospects and customers. That's a great way to get started. Social media is also a fantastic way to listen to your customers. You can do it in your own channels. You can do it on their channels. You can also, you know, go listen to what your customers or your prospects may be saying on competitors' channels, all really good ways to listen. Of course, you can look at third-party research. I find customer councils are a fantastic way to listen. And that means getting, you know, between something like 8 to 15 of your customers together on a regular basis, and I recommend a quarterly basis. You can do it over Zoom. The whole focus of a customer council should not be on you and your products. It should be on your customers and getting them to talk getting them to talk about how they're using your product, what their concerns are, what they'd like to see next, all those things, getting them to influence each other. If you do want to talk about a new product, for example, that's coming out, send the information in advance and then spend the time in the group meeting listening to your customers. Industry councils, another fantastic way to listen. This means getting together more than just your customers. It means bringing in prospects, bringing in influencers, potentially analysts, even potentially bloggers or press, and having a discussion around an industry topic. This can help you learn what's going on in a broader sense, and it also can help position you and your company as a thought leader. And finally, one-on-one. -on -one. So going out and regularly listening to your customers with a one-on-one -on -one conversation can be really edifying. You can learn so much if you listen openly to them. And I want to give you an example of that. Um, recently, one of my clients, GoFundMe, they had a challenge. And I think you probably all know GoFundMe, so they do, you know, personal fundraisers. And um, they had this problem, which was 
that people during the pandemic desperately needed to set up fundraisers. But what they were seeing was when people people would set up the fundraiser, but then to go live with it, to publish it to their family and friends, they wouldn't do that. They would stop right before going live with it. So about 60% of the people who set up a fundraiser, 60% would drop off. So we said, oh gosh, we better go out and listen to people. So we did one-on-ones, both with people who were successful and published and people who were not successful and decided not to go live with their campaign, but it started a campaign. And here's what we heard. We learned that um, people need financial support now more than ever. They were desperate to get help, but they also felt embarrassed they had to ask. And they were really uncomfortable at asking for help. And in fact, it, it felt humiliating to actually have to ask family and friends. And you, you know, if you think about it for a minute, oh my gosh, so hard to do. So we said, okay, we need to figure out a way to use what we heard here to help people get over that hump. And so what we did is we turned to the people who were successful and we used social media to do this. And we said, those of you who have published a campaign, can you describe for the people who are, are, are feeling like they can't get over that hump? Can you tell them why they should go ahead and make their campaign go live? What will they get if that happens? And so instead of us being the ones to tell them, we said, the people who've succeeded, they've been through it. They can probably better explain and influence. So we said, just create a short video and tell people. So let me play for you one of those videos. Um, and you'll hear this guy actually started a campaign. He was successful with it. Now he's encouraging people who can't get over that hump to go ahead and publish their campaign. Hi, my name is Mike Shaw, and I'm from Rochester, New York. When my daughter Jenny was six years old, she was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer. It was a very scary time for our entire family. But Jenny's never been a kid to be counted out. And even at her time of struggle, she decided that she wanted to help other kids that were going through the same things she was going through. So we decided to launch a GoFundMe campaign. At first, we were really nervous because we didn't know if people would actually donate. But the overwhelming support that we received from our community and from all around the world changed how we thought about donations. So if you're passionate about something, but you're still a little nervous to get it started, you never can know the power of your community until you just ask. And today, Jenny is cancer-free, thriving, and giving back in ways we could have never imagined. So again, if you have something that you're passionate about, look at the power of your community by just asking. Hey, isn't that cool? I mean, I loved that video. And look, that cost no money for GoFundMe to do that. All we did is put out a call on our social channels. And I will tell you right now that these ideas about listening, they really don't cost money. Yes, they will take some time, but this is about where you put your priorities and your effort. And so all of these are really, really good ways for you to understand what's going on and then to be able to put campaigns together like this that really have impact. The so listening is very important. So let's move on to talk about how you pack a punch, how you become more relevant and more persuasive. Well, first of all, um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that customers, unfortunately, as much as you may love your product and what you're doing, they don't really care so much about you. Um, they are consumed and thinking about themselves and the problems that they're facing. And so if you really want to pack a punch and you want to have a message that really resonates with people, you have to focus on what you do to help customers solve important problems. Now, let me be clear. The customers may not yet believe these are important problems. And so your job is to persuade them that they have a problem that is the most important problem they have and that you and only you can solve that problem for them. And that's what good messaging is about. So make sure that you're really considering in your message what you're doing to help a customer solve a problem, not just what you're doing. Because I know in high tech, there is a tendency for us to want to describe in detail our products. 
And I think sometimes we think the more we describe our products and in the more detail we describe them, the more persuasive we'll be, but it's simply not true. You have to make your story and your message about your customer or it will not be relevant. So there are some levers that you can pull in packing a punch, being more relevant and persuasive. The first is people, and by people I mean who is your audience? Who are the people that are going to care the most about the problem that you solve? And this, this group of people, it may be in a time of a pandemic or any kind of a crisis, it may change. And I'm going to give you some examples in a minute of how that's happened. So you really want to think about that. Right now, who are you going to be most relevant to? Secondly, your product. You may want to consider changing your product during a crisis as well. You may be able to make it more relevant to the people that are going to care the most. Pricing and packaging is really powerful, and that's an easier thing to change than a product. So I would urge you to consider those. And finally, persuasion or the story, the message you tell. Can you be more relevant during these times? Let me give you a few examples of taking all of these in different combinations and what companies have done to be um, more engaging and more powerful during this time of COVID-19. So let me start with this company, Blended. And Blended is a startup. Uh, they started in Santa Clara, California, the heart of the Silicon Valley. And they created a robot that blends and serves smoothies. <laughs> And I worked for them and, you know, we started maybe about two years ago and they were very, very successful right off the bat. They sold to colleges uh, where students wanted healthy and quick, uh, yummy tasting things and also to workplaces where, you know, they were they had a lot of interest from high tech companies and they were up and running in Adobe and had many more lined up to get the blended units. Um, they were doing really well. They had a, a, a strong message, a strong story around healthy, tasty, and fast, and they were running a campaign called You Deserve It, because if you think about it, college kids really, you know, they really craved healthy, and they loved the idea of watching the robot and high-tech companies as well. So they were doing incredibly well. Well, boom, the pandemic hits, and guess what? Colleges closed down, workplaces closed down, and Blended is in a lot of trouble. And it was it was so sad it broke my heart because I love this company. In fact, I really, that purple drink in the middle, it's called blueberry cacao. That thing, I'm addicted to it. It's terrible. So I was personally concerned about my health. But, um, but that being said, I really was worried about them because, you know, their market was now closed and uh, they didn't have a good story. So what were they going to do? They had to change their message. And I'm going to ask you to help me figure out what would be the right message for Blended to change to. And we're going to run another poll. Go ahead and click on the poll button and let me know what you think the right message is for Blended. Okay, I'm seeing results here. Wow, I'm impressed with you guys. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, I like it that a lot of you are voting for robots don't need masks. It's definitely true, and it probably could be a, a, a very cute campaign. Um, and no one voted for the robot is fast and blends are healthy. So, well, there's one blends are healthy. All right. I love it. But overwhelmingly, we got voting for uh, getting a blend is a contactless automated experience. Okay, great feedback. Let me go back to the presentation and I'm going to show you what they went with. So this is a video that they changed uh, after the pandemic started and when they were repositioning themselves. I'm just gonna show you the beginning of it so you can hear that, how they did position themselves. Meet Blended, a contactless automated solution for healthy on the go eating that's ordered from the safety of your cell phone and prepared by a robot with zero human interaction. You got to hear what they went with, which was overwhelmingly the contactless um, interaction is what they went with. And uh, a lot of you agreed with them on that one. So they went with that, they changed their message, but they didn't stop there because 
you know, they needed to find a new target audience, right? They couldn't keep selling to companies and to um, the universities. And so I'm going to show you where they went. This is their new, their newest customer, and this is the market they're going after now. Uh, so they, they got Walmart as a customer because Walmarts are open. Targets are open. You can imagine the kinds of places they're now going after. They hadn't targeted these before. But now this is the perfect target audience for them. These are the people, the consumers of these uh, institutions are going to want this contactless uh, blend, um, and they're going to want it to be fast, and maybe they're going to want it to be healthy. I don't know, but uh, the point is the contactless is the most important part of it. And um, so they've gotten a big deal with Walmart, and they're in a Walmart right now. Their first one just opened last month, and it's uh, in Fremont, California. So I'll be heading over there to get one of my favorite blends. But they did a very nice job with adjusting uh, adjusting their story and adjusting their customer or their target audience. So let's look at another beverage company. They also sell more than beverages, but hopefully you guys all know Pret a Manger. They started in um, in England, and now they're all over in big cities. It's primarily a place people go for a quick uh, breakfast or a quick lunch. They're in heavily populated business areas of mainly big cities. Um, and they relied on the foot traffic from breakfast and lunch to build their business. Well, you can imagine what happened when the pandemic hit. Uh, they almost had to shut down, essentially. They were getting no foot traffic at all into their stores. And so the marketing people there came up with a very interesting idea. And this, what you're looking at right here, is their home page. So right on their home page, they have a big uh, new offer, which is they're introducing this unlimited coffee passes. It's a really cool idea. So you, you buy a pass and you get, uh, you know, all you can drink for 30 days. Um, I do want to call your attention to the fact that this is on their home page. And when I looked at home pages of many different companies during the pandemic, very few startups had changed their home page. It's a very inexpensive way to target what you're offering, target your message in a more specific way, how people are feeling right now. So I thought this was, very smart of them to do. And then if you click on learn more, you go to this, where you can sign up for 30 days and get uh, get as much coffee as you want, or you can also get premium a premium coffee pass for as many fancy drinks as you want. And I have to say, as a marketer, I loved this as a way to increase engagement, to get more foot traffic into their stores. And here's, here's a few reasons why I loved it. Um, the first one is because it's a limited amount of time. So 30 days, that means people are going to feel like they want to take advantage of this pass and get their money's worth out of it. So they're probably going to try to go into the store a lot. And for print, what that means is, you know, they may come in sometimes and just get a coffee. But often I think Pret is banking on the fact that they're going to buy something else. And it, you know, maybe for breakfast, it may be for lunch, but they will sell much more with this pass. It creates a sense of urgency with the customers, which is really smart. Um, it drives foot traffic. Now, the other thing that I absolutely loved about this campaign is that they offered it on their app. So you had to get the app to take advantage of this campaign. And the reason why apps are so fantastic for increasing engagement is because you have a way to communicate with people one-on-one -on -one in a personal fashion. And today with the technology that's out there, uh, software uh, products like Localytics, you can see people's behavior and you can message them based on what they're doing, right? So it can be very personal messaging to people based on their behavior. So an app is a direct communication channel to an individual and it can be heavily personalized. And so this whole program that Pret has been running is a way for them to increase the number of people who have their app, which ultimately gives them this direct communication channel to their target audience. So good for Pret, incredibly well done, and I think it's working quite well for them now. So let me cover just a straight B2B example, just for those of you that are out there doing B2B and going enough of the consumer stuff. So this is a company called Dial Once. 
they started in Paris, France. They've been very successful. Uh, still a startup, but uh, before they started before the pandemic, were selling pretty well. Um, their message was connecting customers to companies. And what they did, what they still do, is they essentially ensure uh, that customers who are calling into big companies, say a health insurance company or um, a utility, right, that they have their questions answered, whether they're calling it or they're coming in on their website or however, and they use AI to do this. So they figure out what people really need and they send them to a place to get their question answered so that they don't have a frustrating experience. That's what they were doing. They were getting a lot of interest before the pandemic, but they said, hey, with this pandemic, we could actually really get more business if we adjust what we're saying. And they did that. So they went from connecting customers to companies to the message, make sure your customers can reach you during a time of crisis. And you see that the chain, this is the front page of their uh, their sales deck. And they changed it very quickly. So they changed it in April. Right after this pandemic was, people knew it was serious. They said, we're going to go with it. We're going to change it. We're going to become more relevant. And they did a huge email campaign out to many, many of these target audiences for them worldwide, got tremendous response. Like, I could not believe the response to the email campaign. People saying, yes, I want to meet with you. Yes, I want to know more. These are big companies. But also knowing that these are big companies that were their customers, they said, we need to do something so that, that we don't have to go through a lot of red tape to get up and running quickly. And so they also created a new offer, and they called this their Kickstarter offer. Um, and it was very easy for a company at a much lower price to get started. And also, it was easier for Dial Once to get the product installed. It took them less than a week to get the product in and working. They're still running this promo right now. It's been so successful. It's been a way for them to get into many big companies quickly and then to grow their business. So they've changed their messaging. They've changed their uh, offer, how they've priced and packaged what they're doing. And, and the third thing they changed is how they talk about their customers and what their customers are doing. Instead of just showing who's bought their product, they've positioned it as being experienced in crisis management. And they've done this on their website. And they've also done this in their um, sales deck. So instead of just talking about various customers, they're talking about who has used their product for crisis management. So that creates a lot of credibility for them. And that was a really smart way to position their customers and what their customers were doing. So I love what Dial Once has done, and it served them very well. They are doing better than ever. They have so much business now. They've got to figure out how they can actually manage all that business. So very well done on the part of Dial Once. All right. So those are some examples about packing a punch. So let's get to our last um, area, which is, okay, how do you get this message out? How do you get people to hear you um, when there's a lot of messages going out about a lot of different things? So first thing is, you got to make some noise, but you also have to take it to the streets. And by that, I mean, you know, here's this kid who's about to march in a parade, uh, not sitting in a concert hall waiting for people to come in to him, but going out and marching, right? You have got to get out there and you've got to make noise. You can't wait for people to come to you. You've got to be proactive. So it starts with choosing the right channels. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you want to focus on the people who are going to care the most and what are the channels that they are using, that they are most likely to, to see. And then you want to use multiple channels. Um, so often I get CEOs and CMOs who ask me, well, June, you know, help us figure out what's the best channel to use. And, and what I say to them is, it's not going to be one channel. Yes, you're going to see numbers in one channel may look like it's performing better, but what you don't realize is all the channels affect each other. So someone may see something at first in, in a um, social media feed, but then it may take them seeing it in an ad to push them over the edge to go purchase. So you don't know what their journey is. So it's important to use multiple channels. Also, people don't hear you necessarily just seeing one channel, or they may not even have looked at the channel you're using. So you want to use multiple channels. You want to figure out what's the best mix of channels, not what one single channel is that you should be using. And then I always advise uh, companies don't give up too soon. 
um, there's a tendency to want things to work right off the bat. Well, if it's not working after a week, oh, we failed. Usually uh, when you change things, it's going to take you a good three months to see really significant uptick. In the meantime, you can start optimizing what you're doing. And you want to test to optimize and learn as quickly as you can. But one thing you know as a marketer is you're going to have a lot of failures and a lot of short-term failures, and you want to see how you can optimize, improve, and ultimately get something to succeed. So that's how you've got to get started. Now, let me give you an example of a company that I think did something really, really interesting in terms of being heard in the market. This is a British company. It's named Emily's Snacks. And I hadn't heard of them because I think we're not in, in England. But um, when I went on the Internet to do a search to start investigating this whole topic of increasing engagement, this company came up all over the place. I can't believe how prominent it was because it's gotten a huge amount of PR. So just think about that. Just by the virtue of them running an innovative campaign, they got a lot of PR. Now, let me tell you what their campaign was. Before the pandemic, they had uh, come up with a campaign that they were going to run. The, the uh, slogan was Ditch Dull, Eat Bold. Essentially, what Emily did is uh, the, the company created interesting snack foods that competed with your kind of what they would call dull and boring standard potato chips. So these were vegetable snacks. They were interestingly flavored, bright, bold packaging. And they bought a whole bunch of outdoor advertising on bus shelters, mainly in big cities in the UK. Well, guess what? The pandemic hit right before they were going to go live with the bus shelter. And um, they had a discussion internally and they said, God, should we try to get our money back on these bus shelters or, or should we just go for it. And their advertising agency really encouraged them to just go for it. They were going to adjust their message, but they were going to go with these bus shelters. So they did. And they went live. It was after the pandemic had struck. And you can see what they did. So our, our first ever poster seen by a runner and one pigeon. Typical. And mm, Maybe we should have made a TV ad instead. And finally, behold our new poster. Now we've just got to find someone to look at it. And these are pretty funny. I mean, they're very self-deprecating. They're very British, understated, kind of, you know, definitely bring a smile to your face. But, you know, I was I was looking at this campaign and I was going, yeah, but, you know, look at the street. There's no one on the street. So, yeah, they're funny. But who's really looking at these things? This seems a little silly. Well, guess what happened? Um, the few people who were out there thought they were funny enough to take pictures of them and share them on social media. And, you know, word got out. People started sharing on their sites, started sharing on Emily's sites. And, you know, they started to see a real uptick in social shares. You can see these two posters are kind of funny as well. And this thing took off like wildfire, and everybody in the UK was talking about it and talking about Emily's snacks, and their products started to sell, and it was a huge success for them. Very interesting story because they they did they did something very risky as they chose a channel that they didn't think people would be looking at, but their customers were the ones who picked it up, thought it was funny, and shared it. And it kind of harkens back to the GoFundMe campaign where having your customers deliver the message can become a very powerful form of engagement because they become the people who are actually marketing your product. That is the ultimate in engagement. And sometimes it feels a little risky to do. And in this case, it was a little risky to do, but the results were really fantastic. So I want to encourage you to take action now. And, you know, a lot of people in my consulting business say to me, hey, you know, June, like this pandemic thing, we're going to just hold on to our money for now. We're not going to do anything because we're, you know, we wanted to see where this all comes out. And what I would say to you is I don't think that's the right approach. I think right now is the time where it is a perfect time to increase your engagement because look at this guy. He's sitting there at home. We're all trapped at home. And I've never seen numbers like I've seen on webinars um, recently. I had a webinar recently that uh, that I worked on that had over a thousand people. Um, incredible numbers. And 
people are looking, just like me and my neighbors, they're looking for ways to be engaged now. People feel isolated. You need to give them the opportunity to engage with you, to engage with others, and they will do it. So now is the time. You know, trying to do a webinar when people are traveling is brutal to get people's attention. So doing it now is a great way to get started, a great way to build your customer base. So I want to talk about where you can be seen. And there are multiple channels, and you should be using a channel mix. You should be using, as I said, a number of these. But I do want to stress that using the channels to get engagement, it's not about talking about what you do. It's about creating a conversation. It's about provoking people to want to comment back to you or to share with others, to promote what you're doing to others, or to promote what they've done with you, right? Those are all examples that we've talked about today. So the channels that are available to you, you know, we know social media. Maybe you haven't considered doing an organic boost where you posted something and then you can actually pay some money to Facebook to get a little more visibility out there beyond your own um, your own followers. That's a tremendous thing. It usually works very well. Email is kind of underrated, but look, none of these cost money right now. So email is a another fantastic way to get engagement and to reach out to people. People are going through their inboxes now. They have more time. They're sitting in front of their desk more. They're compute, commuting less. Think about email. We've talked about webinars. They're great. Um, digital advertising. If you have the budget, it's the only thing up here that really is going to cost you some money to do effectively, but it can be a very powerful way to get engagement. Um, also, consider your partners. If you have partners, uh, they have marketing channels too, and working with them, have them help you engage with their customers, and you likewise to do the same for them, uh, can be also a really fantastic channel to use. Finally, I, I mentioned earlier your website. You know, don't forget your own website. It's such a great way to create an engaging experience um, and to start conversations and finally to share content. So, you know, create that content that is going to cause someone to want to engage further with you, to learn more, to read what you've written, and perhaps to respond back to you or to share that content with other people who may care. That's your goal here. <laughs> and your goal is to figure out what group of these works best. And I would say to you that money should not be an issue for you. Most of these things do not cost any money or a lot of money. So it's really important. Maybe you feel like you haven't done it before. There's a lot of information on the Internet. Uh, there's people you can talk to, but give it a try. Now, this is um, this is an example of something that Meetup did. Many of you may know them because they are an organization that serves entrepreneurs. I love them. I think they do a great job. They used to have these meetings where people could get together and talk about various uh, various things. Of course, now nobody's meeting together, so they've been running webinars, and they decided that they would actually set up a webinar and webinars and teach entrepreneurs how to run them. So they just did this. I think it was just a couple of days ago. Very good webinar to help uh based on what they've learned from running the webinars to help other entrepreneurs to use webinars effectively. I think this is actually available now. You can get the recording of it. But I love this, and they marketed it through all sorts of channels. You know, they used their uh, social media channels. They used a lot of email to get it out there and uh, got a really good attendance to this. So well done for them using their channels and also using the channel itself as a form of content. So I want to pull all this together for you right now so that you can really think about what you're going to do uh, into some do's and don'ts that are going to help you to think through when you're thinking about how do you increase engagement during difficult times of change. And on my do list, the first one is listen to your customers. We talked about that. And it's not just listening. It's institutionalizing ways to listen to your customers on a regular basis. People's feelings change over time, and you want to get that pulse. You also want to think about your offer. Do you need to adjust your offer? Do you need to adjust your message? And, and you really want to get out there now and start making some noise, creating, 
creating some heat because now is the time to be heard. So act boldly now, act with urgency, create a message that is urgent for your customers, and then be flexible. Adjust adjust if you need to. Uh, don't change it overnight, but start optimizing and testing small things to see if you can make it better. Give it at least three months. And then finally, create a conversation. So don't When you're thinking about engaging, don't think about talking at or telling. Think about how do I provoke? How do I get people to respond? How do I get people to share? What are those things that I can do so that it's not a one-way marketing channel? So on the don't side, don't take action until you really understand what your customers' concerns are and how they're feeling. Make sure you know that. And, And that really ties to my next point on the don'ts, which is, I didn't talk about this today, but when I was looking on the internet at different things people were doing right now during the pandemic, a number of people used messages that weren't as appropriate as they needed to be to be persuasive. And then the topic became the inappropriate messages versus the engagement. Um, That's not the kind of engagement you're looking for. And so make sure if you're coming up with new messages that you run it by a few people, perhaps a few prospects, a few customers, Um, certainly your own sales team or your other marketers, just to test it and make sure that you're on target. Don't wait and see. Don't do what so many people have asked me about, which is just sitting back and watching. Now is the best time to be proactive. And again, don't don't try to get everything right the first time. Don't tr- if you're a perfectionist, this is not for you. <laughs> you cannot be perfect. You will not be perfect. This is not possible. So get out and try things, and then adjust as you learn. Um, also, don't try to do exactly what other people are doing. Now, I gave you some good examples today of what people are doing, and you may want to use some of those ideas, but make sure you tailor them to your business, to your customers, to your product, to what you're doing specifically. Also, don't talk at your audience again. It's about a conversation. And finally, um, I haven't talked about this today, but I do want to mention that I've done a lot of testing of messages through email, through social media. I don't think I've ever seen a negative message win over a positive message. So even though people may be feeling negatively, you want to keep your message on the positive side. Um, Or you can use humor. Um, but positive or humorous, but not negative, because negative usually does not convert as well as positive. So that's a good list of of things that you should be doing and things that you're going to want to watch as you go forward and try to increase your engagement. So I want to wrap up my uh, formal comments today with a poll. And this last poll I want to find out what you're going to be doing when you leave here today. So let's take a look at that. Go ahead and click on your poll button. And if you wouldn't mind, one last poll for me. That would be great. Well, so far, nobody wants to plan their Thanksgiving menu. No, some people do. (laughs) We have no one adjusting their offer or creating a new campaign. But we're getting there. All right. Awesome. Looking good. So no one's going to adjust their offer. But we've got people clicking the other. And I hope you all who are planning your Thanksgiving menu are going to have fun doing that. But I will say this. Once you're done planning your Thanksgiving menu, I'm really hoping that you're going to come back and do one of these others on my list. And I see that most of you are are thinking about, well, many of you are thinking about finding ways to listen to your customers, which I think is a great way to get started. And I think messaging messaging is, is hard to think through, but it's easy to implement. So I think those are great choices. Um, All right. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. And I want to wrap up my formal remarks today with just a couple things. First of all, we are going to have Q&A, so I'd love to have you. If you haven't put your questions in, please go put them in there. You can also put comments in there if you'd like. Um, But I do want to also um, encourage you to take action. 
after you're done planning your Thanksgiving menu, if that was your choice. And also, if you'd like to contact me, here's my contact information. You can take a, a photo of this slide. I think it'll be available later to all of you as well. Um, but you can you can email me. You can uh, link in with me and send me a message. And I also like to offer to those of you who are on the call today, uh, I'd love to learn more about what you're trying to do and help you increase your engagement. I'm gonna, totally happy to spend a half an hour with you if you'd like uh, to look at what your specific challenges are and to offer any ideas that I might have on how you can increase your engagement. So please feel free to message me. I would love to hear from you and I'd love to engage with you individually one-on-one. -on -one. So don't hesitate to do that if you think I can help. So I also want to thank the uh, Wharton team for the fantastic job they have done putting this together. I can't tell you how professional and amazing they are. They really are, every one of them. And um, I, I really appreciate their help. And I really appreciate all of you joining today. Don't go away yet, though, because I really do want to answer your questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Irina, who's going to uh, field those questions and uh pass them over to me. So, Irina, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to stop sharing. Right. Thank you so much, June. We do have a handful of questions, the first of which is, what are examples of positive and negative messages? Yeah. So, uh, um, many times people say, <clears throat> you know, fear is something that people are going to respond to, so let's scare customers. So, let's tell them, hey, if you don't look at this now, your business is going to drop. Your business isn't going to do well. Or, hey, if you don't do something about this pandemic right now, your business is going to be in trouble, right? That's a negative message. <clears throat> so instead of instilling fear in people's hearts, <clears throat> you probably want to go with a more hopeful message like, hey, now's the perfect time to take action and take advantage of the change and the change that's going on around you. Right. So that would be taking something that could be considered fearful and turning into something very positive. And it's that positive side that tends to get better results. That's really helpful. Less fear marketing, more about the opportunity. And this is a moment, different perspective. Um, another question, um, which communication method to current customers and future customers is most effective? Which communication method? Um, maybe it's a channel, oh, channel channel question. Yeah. So again, channels are funny because not there isn't one that's going to be most effective. It's going to be a blend of multiple channels. Using just one um, is is going to limit how often people see your message and how many people see your message. Do so you want to create a mix? And there's a trend right now going into marketing. It's called omni-channel marketing, and that just simply means using multiple channels. And you're going to want to use many channels, and you're going to want to then look at the results in each channel. So, you know, for example, in social media, you're going to want to look at how many people are following, how many people are sharing, how many people are engaging and commenting, right? Those are the kinds of things that you're going to want to look at uh, in social media, but you're going to also want to look at other channels. So, um, you know, with webinars, how many people are um, are signing up for a webinar, registering, and then how many people are attending? But I will tell you with webinars, registrations are way more important than people who attend because you're going to market to the people who register, um, and that'll be a much bigger group than people who actually attend. So I think try – my advice to you is try many channels, as many as you have time to try. Uh, and interest to try, and then you're going to want to see how they perform over time and balance your mix. Try new things, see how they work. You're also going to see how one channel may affect another. For example, if you send out an email, that may increase the number of people who visit your website. It may also increase the number of people who go to your social media channels. So be aware that one channel will affect other channels and how much people use other channels. So my advice to you is, you know, be a mad scientist. Go in there and experiment and learn and watch your results and then test and learn between your channels and try to optimize your channel mix. But I will tell you, it's always changing. It's a very difficult thing to do. So I just say, try it all. See where you get performance. All right. Thanks, June. Another question was in reference to the blended deal uh, or partnership with um, Walmart and whether you think Walmart's deal with blended is meant that the retailer is shifting their brand from a price sensitivity 
uh, Amazon competition to becoming a more upscale experience? Ooh, that's such a good question. And it's a really, um, it's really perceptive about Walmart. Um, the, the, the thing that I didn't tell you about blended is their blends are actually not expensive. <laughs> so they cost typically five or six dollars, um, a piece, which is less than you would find at a, uh, Jamba Juice or even, you know, their competition coffee stores are going to be usually more expensive than that. So, so blends for being fresh and delicious are, and, and without any human interaction are incredibly um, well priced. So I think it is kind of within their brand as it stands now, but it's certainly about differentiation. And I think it's such a good question because it points out that, you know, their competition right now doesn't have blended and it will be an attraction. Um, right now we are all, you know, stuck at home. So the only places we can go are like Target and <laughs> grocery stores and, and, you know, to other big stores and the Walmart is one of them. And, you know, taking kids out to see the robot make blends, talk about a fun activity for people to do. So I think from Walmart's perspective, I think it's within their brand, but I think it's very smart of them because it's a way for them to create an interaction and to create differentiation that otherwise wouldn't be there. So good for Walmart for doing this. Thanks, Jen. Another question was about, you know, how long should one wait before declaring a strategy or messaging was a bust? Oh, such a good question, too. Yeah, f for me, I think you want to look at a couple of things. Usually I try to run a campaign for at least three months because that's the amount of time it takes. Get the message out there and have enough people in your target audience hear you. There are certain exceptions, though, when you are getting a lot of interaction telling you, it's way off base. Um, so, for example, if someone is putting messages in your, lots of people are putting messages in social media saying, hey, this doesn't resonate or this doesn't work or this is off base. You're going to want to make sure you're listening to your customers, the people that are looking at it when you're running it. Um, I've actually never had that happen. And I've done a huge, huge number of campaigns in my time. But I always listen very carefully just to make sure. And if not, just to start tweaking and optimizing that campaign to make it better and better. And then in the end, you may not get the results you want. You may say, hey, we tried optimizing everything we could. But usually if you're listening and you're changing and you've listened before you've put that campaign out there, using optimization, you can get to the point where that cam campaign is working fairly well for you. So I do advise, you know, you may be getting a lot of people going, hey, this isn't working, you know, during the first month, but you're going to just have to calm them down. And the most important thing to do is to set expectations with your own internal team and say, this will take three months. Let's not pull the plug until we've given it a good amount of time to be successful. Good advice. So three months to get enough feedback about how it's going or um, looking at kind of the results of that, those campaigns or messaging. Um, another question is that, in your opinion, what role does a strong sales organization have in the new world of customer experience, specifically as it relates to, you know, you know, currently, you know, teams having poorly executed sales teams aren't responding to leads in a timely manner, et cetera? Yeah. Um, sales is always a challenge when you're a marketer in a B2B organization and you want to build as good a relationship as you can with sales. And I really encourage you to interact with sales in ways that are not necessarily contentious as often as you can. So, for example, the listening idea of setting up a way to listen uh, on a quarterly basis uh, where it's not just about selling. I think that's important to build your relationship with sales. Um, and then I think making sure whenever you start a campaign to include sales from the very beginning, even in what the campaign should be about. I always try to include sales and make them feel a part of it. So that when it comes time for them to follow through, they feel like it's theirs and they feel more ownership and they actually want to help make it happen in the end. Also clearly setting expectations from the beginning about what you're going to need from sales and what marketing is going to do and making sure sales is completely bought in from the very beginning of a campaign is going to help you make it successful. Right. Um, do you favor one social media channel over another? I think it depends on your audience, but I have always found that um, Facebook 
videos perform well for every kind of business, whether it's B2B or B2C. Videos are tremendous and uh, they've got to be short though. So 15 seconds to maximum 30 seconds is going to get you good results, um, uh, get people to watch and um, super, super effective. LinkedIn, I found to be less effective. Also, if it's in a paid channel with LinkedIn, it's very expensive. As much as you think you're targeting, you can target just as well in Facebook, even if it's for, if it's for business topics. Um, and so, you know, my experience so far is, you know, I would probably vote for Facebook overall, but there are some situations where other channels are going to perform better. How often should we be posting on social media channels without it becoming quote, too much? Yeah, it's hard to do, but uh, I, I advise posting every day and multiple times per day. Um, but you can't just, you know, you can you can repost things that you posted, but you want to always be thinking about new content, new questions to ask, new ways to engage. And so it's really important. And if you are running a campaign, that's the best way to do it, where you can tie everything into a single campaign, just the way GoFundMe did with their campaign to get their customers to talk about how they got over that hump. You know, you want to tie it to things that are relevant to people. And so many people, so many companies are offering marketing services across industries. What tools uh, could you suggest to determine which is the best marketing partner for the folks here with their firms, with their with their ventures? The best marketing, what tools do you suggest to determine which is the best marketing partner for them? I don't know that there's any tools, but I will say that, you know, first you really want to know what you want. You want to have some idea of what your budget is in advance. Um, and then I really recommend that you talk to people who you trust and who've used various uh, various organizations. I think that marketers, I know from a number of polls I've done and I've also looked at that they, they choose partners based on what other marketers say. And I, I actually think that's very sage and wise advice. And some folks are curious about if you had Apple stories from your experience with Apple to share that's relevant to this conversation that we oh. could learn from. I have a lot of stories. That come, that come to mind, I guess, maybe the top one or top two with respect to this conversation. Well, I will say that um, <clears throat> one thing that I think is really interesting is um, when it was um, right after the Macintosh had shipped and then IBM came out with their own PC. And... Um, Everybody was saying, oh, my God, IBM's going to cream. Apple's dead because Apple's not focusing on companies. And Apple was very proud. In fact, if you go and look at the 1984 ad that Apple ran, it was all about kind of destroying companies like IBM and uh, really focusing on consumers and renegades. <clears throat> and Steve Jobs actually published an advertisement in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was in the New York Times, too. And it said, welcome, IBM. And it basically said, we welcome you because, you know, we don't really care what you're doing. We're going to do what we're doing and you just go ahead and sell to companies. And people pre really predicted the end of Apple. But really what happened was that Apple actually was reinforcing its own brand position uh, during a time that was they might have been tempted to change their message. It was kind of a crisis for Apple in that a big company was coming in because they were going to push Apple out. But it reinforced the position that Apple was the company that appealed to people who didn't believe they belonged anywhere. They didn't feel they belonged in major corporations. They felt special and they felt uh, that anybody who wanted them, that was probably not a group that they wanted to be a part of. And so, in fact, it really strengthened Apple's position and enabled them to ultimately be very successful. IBM, as you know, has gotten out of the PC business. They're not in it anymore. And yesterday, Apple announced three new computers that are absolutely amazing, and I'm going to be buying one of them in the very near future. So a great story about sticking to your guns, sticking to your positioning, and sticking to your message. Sometimes you need to do that when times get tough. I think that's a great note to conclude our Q&A. We've run out of time, but it's really helpful. Thank you for sharing the additional insight, June. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Caro Daloff, who leads programming at WAFA, to share some remarks. Thanks, Irina. Uh, for the introduction. And thank you so much, June, for spending this past hour with us and sharing these, these practical things that we can do to engage with our customers. 
I would also like to thank Wharton of San Francisco for your help for organizing this great event. And thank you all for joining us uh, today and for all the great questions. The next slide will have an upcoming WAFA event and you can take a picture of it or you can go to hello, hello wafa.org that's h e l l o w a f f a .org and i hope you all have a great day and thank you so much for attending today